meeting a week from today. <laughs> oh yeah, faculty, we have a meeting a week from today. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, I was going to originally say a few words about uh, Bird's All Dry Special Series, but I think David's got a slider for it. But then, then I realized, second, I, well, maybe I'll say something because both Bird's All and, and Dry's got their introduction to geology with hydrogeology and the USGS. Um, and Bird's, Bird's All actually also grew up or went to school in Connecticut <laughs> and then went to Princeton and Columbia. And and now he grew up in the, in the 1920s. Um, and then uh, World War II broke out, so he stopped his graduate career. But he um, applied to, to uh, the Army and got rejected. <laughs> got rejected. So he went to the USGS, and they accepted him. He got rejected because he was too old. 38. 38, he was too old. But he, got, he wrote a letter to the director of the USGS, uh, Mendenhall, at the time, okay. um, and got a position at the USGS until 1968 when he hmm. retired. And it was Bird's all idea to do this kind of series where you get some of the best and the brightest today. I don't know about <laughs> that, but <laughs> to communicate their science and a passion for geosciences and hydrogeology to the community and around the world. So we're glad to have, have David here following that tradition. And David was uh, oh, <clears throat> got, also got the connection to hydrogeology for USGS as an undergraduate intern. I think that's mm -hmm. yeah. important. And yeah. in Michigan, where he's a Michigan State Bachelor of Science degree. Then he went west to New Mexico for a PhD and has been at Amherst since 2006 or so. Yeah, 2005. Yeah, it's been a while. Yes, yes professor. Um, he's, I've known him from uh, a few years ago. We were on a, a drilling ship together for six weeks. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of quality time with Tim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool virtual golf and a few other games. Yeah. Um, he was a hydrologist and I was a structural geologist and it turns out his was really structure hydrology combined, so we got along, along really well. Um, and he's, one of the things to talk about David, to mention about David, is his diversity. He really has a big, broad background of applying hydrogeology. And I looked at his grants. You know, he's got the Department of Energy, NSF, and you know, he's got the Ocean Drilling Program, Continental Drilling Program, Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, Massachusetts Clean Energy Fund. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all these different directions. And now he's working on a, restoring a, a bog, I think, in Connecticut. Yeah. Part of uh, I don't but think so, but okay. yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> but it's clo it's closer it's closer to home for sure. But today yeah. he's talking about the climate uh, groundwater. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, David. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tim, and um, and thanks for bearing with me. Uh, had to cancel my my last visit. Uh, came down with a little bug on one of my uh, travels to South America <laughs> the week before. So. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk a little bit of this is um, this project really uh, started out of some work that I was doing when I got to um, when I got to UMass, and um, it uh, essentially was a uh, a little bit of a, a hobby project, and it turned into I think a really interesting story about sort of the role of groundwater and the role of sort of shallow groundwater storage um, in hydrologic processes. Um, here in the Northeast U.S. And um, so as, um, as Tim alluded to, so this is uh, part of a GSA hydrogeology division sponsored lecture series that was originally named after John Manning Birdsall, USGS Water Resources uh, Division Geologist. Actually, the first lecture was in 1978, Jacob Baer, and he gave one talk. Um, at the University of Wisconsin, and so my colleagues uh, in the last couple of years have been giving up to about 50 to 60 talks all over, all over the world. And uh, I'm not quite on that 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 number, but uh, we'll see how far I get. 
Um, and then uh, in 1992, Shirley Dreiss, um, a brilliant uh, hydrogeochemist, was the Birdsall lecturer, and she unfortunately died a year later, and money was uh, raised by friends and family to rename the uh, Birdsall Lecture Series the Birdsall Dreiss Lecture Series. So um, again, hydrogeology division at the, um, at the GSA, really uh, trying to support the, the uh, sharing of knowledge in the field of uh, in the field of hydrogeology. So um, just quickly, um, this is a sort of a long ongoing project that really actually started with a, uh, a master student of mine in 2009 that was interested in looking at relationships between groundwater and climate. Um, and then we've kind of continued on this work uh, with sort of funding from NYWER, USGS, and then uh, most re recently some money from uh, these license plates that you see around uh, Massachusetts that support the Massachusetts Environmental Trust. So um, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about really the role of groundwater storage uh, in stream flow generation and its relationship to uh, changes in climate um, and some of the role of uh, subsurface uh, storage res reservoirs, really ranging everything from sort of uh, the shallow till um, that covers a lot of these post-glaciated landscapes to the deeper bedrock system. So first of all, I'm going to just sort of run through a brief um, sort of overview of where I see groundwater in the hydrologic cycle. Um, and then we'll look at some work that we've done looking at sort of the role of uh, different aspects of the landscape in, in uh, stream flow generation and groundwater storage to precipitation of variability. And then um, I'm going to wrap up with some more recent work that we've been doing looking at the role of uh, large precipitation events or wetter periods um, here in the Northeast and their uh, importance to groundwater storage um, and transport. And so sort of the, the underlying theme here in a lot of what I'm talking about is uh, really thinking about how groundwater buffers and sort of uh, dampens um, or accelerates the uh, sort of surface hydrologic response to climate and climate variability. So if you look at the sort of global hydrologic budget, um, really we're looking at a system that's sort of dominated by uh, fluxes of precipitation uh, to the land surface and evapotranspiration off the land surface. And one of the things that I want to uh, sort of make sure that you understand is if we look globally at the amount of water that's coming out of streams, um, about two-thirds of that, sort of 15.3 plus 30.2, now these are in cubic kilometers of water per year times 10 to the 3. This is a lot of water, but two-thirds of that water that's coming into rivers has spent some time in the ground, okay? And the role of uh, the water that comes in in terms of the sort of changes in storage play a really important role in how sort of hydrologic res systems respond to changes um, in climate. And so um, just there's some obvious things here why we should under care about groundwater processes. And I would argue, especially here in the Northeast, um, it's all about stream flow generation, understanding sort of the timing of when water comes into the ground and water comes out of the ground, fairly critical in humid temperate areas where most of the stream flow is generated through groundwater processes. Um, obviously important for drinking water. Um, one of the things that's becoming more and more apparent, as I'll talk about today, is understanding sort of nuisance flooding and flood risk in, um, in wet areas that are soon to be wetter. Um, understanding relationships between groundwater storage food, uh, for food supply, water quality, and then um, green energy, everything from sort of hydropower to um, another talk that I'm giving in this lecture series deals with lithium deposits and their relationship to uh, groundwater. So um, one of the things that we know in the field of hydrogeology is that when you go out and you look at the um, amount of water in a stream and a response of a stream to a precipitation event, do the dominant signal of that water in the stream is not from the recent precipitation event, but is from stored water in the ground. And so this uh, old stored water, this old water paradox is a really important uh, mechanism from which we understand sort of the chemical solute mass budgets to stream solute loading. Uh, to streams. And essentially you could think about it as this sort of at the hill slope scale before we have let's say a precipitation event or let's say a melt event, 
the water table slopes down towards the stream. Um, as we have a precipitation event or a melt, the water table rises in response to that, dries water out to the stream, uh, continues to do that, and activates sort of different mechanisms by which the water is making it to the stream. And we can see that, let's say, in this graph here. This is a hydrograph uh, normalized by watershed area during um, a melt ev event up in Vermont, where we see a predominant fraction of the water in the stream is actually old water with some mixing of new water coming into the stream. So suggesting that uh, streams are really sort of important integrate integrators of groundwater processes at the hill slope scale. Now, this process not um, just happens sort of at the small scale in New England. This is a really cool paper that came out in Nature Geoscience a couple of years ago where these authors actually um, show that the uh, amount of water in major streams uh, uh, sort of draining the Himalayans, most of that water is groundwater storage. Uh, most of that water um, actually being stored uh, snow and glacial melt in sort of shallow alluvial aquifer systems and then being discharged um, into the streams over time. So this is a large scale process that's important. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between the water table and the land surface. It's really important in terms of thinking about how um, sort of stream flow is generated and how water is stored. This is a really nice sort of schematic that tries um, and sort of conceptualization that tries to quantify the relationship between, so this um, is recharge here, um, so the amount of water that's making it to the ground. L here is some length scale, could be like the uh, characteristic scale, the flow system. This is a hill slope here showing some topography. This uh, gray dashed line here is, um, is the water table. And in cases where we have a lot of recharge relative to the characteristics of the subsurface, this is the hydraulic conductivity. So it's a measure of how easy the aquifer can sort of transmit water. And these are other length scale char or, um, characteristics of the subsurface. What we see is when this quantity is large, when we either have high recharge rates or the hydraulic conductivity is low, what happens is the water, ta water ta table tends to mount and it captures and it couples really strongly to the, sub to the uh, surface and we drive a lot of water out of the system sort of through direct groundwater surface interactions. When this uh, ratio becomes uh, small or less than one, so this is non-dimensionless, um, it's either a case where we have a really high hydraulic conductivity or a low recharge. So this would be like, you know, interior sort of Connecticut, um, Massachusetts. This might be like uh, sort of Cape Cod, um, southeast Massachusetts, where we have a really high hydraulic conductivity substrate and we tend to drive water um, sort of regionally, and it does, isn't as coupled to the um, land surface. So um, I just want you to think about as the water table rises and falls, it's sort of more or less connected to the land surface. And this can happen over you know, days, it can happen over weeks, and um, perhaps even uh, longer time periods than that. One of the things that we know, thinking about groundwater and climate change, there's a lot of interest in this right now, trying to understand how the changes in hydrology are going to impact the amount of water that's stored on the ground and stream flow generation and other processes. Um, a lot of the work has been focused in regions that are sort of experienced, dr experiencing drying trends. Okay, So these are areas in the western U.S. and some of the areas where we're currently actually pumping a lot of fossil groundwater um, to begin with. And so um, in this case, what we're seeing is sort of the, in areas where we're seeing wetter conditions, we're seeing soil moisture that becomes drier, we're seeing sort of less of groundwater um, recharge and more aquifer um, depletion. Uh, as we get closer to the coast, there's a lot of concerns about sort of how um, seawater intrusion is going to uh, impact coastal communities and the amount of water um, that becomes saline in response to that. There hasn't been as much work on how um, in regions like Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Northeast U.S., how um, changes in uh, precipitation are going to impact water storage, uh, water availability, and then even um, significant amounts of um, nuisance flooding in response to rising uh, water tables. Um, there was a nice paper that just came out 
last year by some European colleagues. They're actually looking at this um, process across um, Europe, and they actually show there's certain parts of sort of northern Europe, um, UK, and into Scandinavia where they're actually seeing that the timing of when soil moisture is high actually is leading to uh, periods of increased um, increased flooding, but this signal is not sort of uniformly distributed and has really strongly tied to sort of the climatology of the region. Um, if we look here closer to home, so this is a plot of total annual precipitation, okay, here uh, versus uh, time going back about 100, um, 120 years now, um, we see that there are periods in, uh, in the past where we've seen changes in the precipitation regime. So this is uh, across Massachusetts. Um, we're already seeing pretty significant changes in temperature, sort of warming of quarter degree uh, per decade since the 1970s. We're seeing fairly large changes in spring ice out dates around the region and timing of uh, high river flows is actually shifting earlier and earlier into the year. On top of that, we've seen actually quite an amazing increase in precipitation um, in the last 70 years, sort of really coming out of the 1960s drought here, which is going to be a sort of a, 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 a very common event that we're gonna, I'm going to talk about in this talk. Um, but if you look at some of the times where we had these large precipitation events, these are this is fairly wet. We're talking, you know, mean annual precipitation in inches per year up to like 60 inches per year on top of a fairly wet climate to begin with. These are all times where we've had sort of large uh, amounts of tropical moisture making it up to the north through tropical storms. So one of the questions is, is how important are these types of events in groundwater storage and in our overall hydrologic budgets. Obviously, you guys um, living here in, um, in stores during this most recent drought here actually started about three or four years earlier um, associated with this sort of anomaly um, and precipitation. Interesting enough, those are years where we didn't really see a lot of tropical moisture um, come north. So um, now I want to uh, talk briefly uh, just a little bit about the geology of sort of a post-glaciated landscape. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with um, some of this work uh, sort of by the stones, um, looking at sort of the fractured bedrock aquifer systems that underlay a lot of the landscapes that are overlined by a series of, um, a lot of which are essentially uh, fining upward sequences of post-glacial uh, deposits or um, so these are glacial lakes that sat in the valleys um, essentially depositing things uh, sediments coarse grain uh, you know fluvial materials that are uh, range and permeability across the order of five or six order of magnitudes that are mostly in these north south trending valleys with sort of till covered um, uplands here so this um, this landscape when we look at this and we think about sort of how the water table is going to respond to climate variability depending if you're in the uplands here or if you're in the lowlands or even if you let's say have wells that tap into the underlying aquifer systems the response to those changes are going to be dependent on the properties of the subsurface and their degree of hydraulic connection from the aquifer um, to the land surface so one of the things that we've been trying to do is trying to understand how subsurface heterogeneity at the landscape scale is impacting sort of the climate driven responses of these systems and so we're doing this using a sort of a data driven approach um, looking at instrumental records of uh, groundwater surface water precipitation variability so um, just um, I'm sure a lot of you in this room uh, have seen outcrops of sort of the tills in this region one of the really interesting things I grew up in Michigan where we have um, really uh, you know we had shaley really fine bedrock the tills there look don't look anything like this okay so these are um, even though they're kind of a poorly mixture a poor mixture of sand gravel and fines they tend to have actually quite a bit of storage capacity uh, and permeability compared to other tills um, 
you know, ranging from the tills to sort of some of the glacial fluvial sediments and sort of the large um, outwash and delta systems that feed into the glacial lake deposits over here, underlain by um, fractured bedrock systems. So if you look at um, sort of a kilometer scale of a map, this is from up near um, the Amherst region, you can actually see if you look at the landscape here, sort of this orange or these sort of came terraces and other sort of glacial fluvial deposits that are on top of um, either thin or thick till, so these are drumlins underlain by bedrock. It can be quite variable at small scales across the landscape, and we're trying to understand that signal of variability um, utilizing a really great data set. So this is a, um, a map, this is from uh, February when I was putting together the talk that I was going to give to you guys back then um, of the Climate Response Network system. So these are groundwater monitoring wells where water levels are either monitored monthly, which used to be the case. Um, now and a lot of times these are automated systems at about 15 minute intervals to look at how the water table is changing in response to precipitation events. So um, a number of years ago uh, we started this study um, across New England, compiling, oops, uh, compiling all of this data, um, trying to understand the response of the groundwater system to climate variability. Um, so we had 124 wells, so these are 124 individual wells categorized in the four hydrogeologic units, um, tills, glacial fluvial deposits, bedrock, and outwash plains. Um, and these are records that go back in um, sort of the minimum we were looking at somewhere on the order of about 30 years of records. So sort of longer time scale records. And then complementing them with um, precipitation and temperature measurements at met stations and stream flow measurements to try to understand their relationships. So um, one of the important things to understand about the hydrology of this region is if you look at this sort of blue line, solid blue line. This is precipitation from January to December. Um, over long term, it's fairly normally distributed. There's no strong seasonality. Where we get seasonality really comes into essentially the growing season, the plants uh, essentially changing soil moisture. And what that does is um, outside of, uh, this is stream flow, this is groundwater level. You can see we drive these seasonal signals, a little bit of snow melt here, but this longer um, you know, this long broad signal here really driven by precipitation minus potential evaporation, essentially the evaporation or landscape water demand that occurs in a sort of humid temperate climate. Um, that drives the water table to have this strong seasonal signal. And actually right when we start um, sort of in the October range, right when the, um, the leaves or the, um, the trees drop their leaves, we actually see the stream flows just rise because of that sort of lack of demand from plants. So if we take a look at some of the data that, um, that we've worked with, so this is what the raw data looks like in blue, and then this is a three month moving average through. So this is the water level above some datum, so this is the hydraulic head um, in a well. Um, what we're interested in is we're not necessarily interested in that annual signal. We want to look at sort of longer term trends here, and that's what this data is down here. So this has just taken the, the value in any given month and subtracting it by the mean of that month across the data set. So that's the, what's, what I'm calling an anomaly here. And a normalized anomaly is just the, the value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. And this allows us to compare different types of um, hydroclimate data sets to one another. So let's just take a look at this example here. Um, this is a piezometer nest in Pelham, Massachusetts. A piezometer nest are, um, is a nest of wells at the exact same location that are driven to different um, depths in different geologic materials or even the same geologic material. So what we're looking at is an unconfined aquifer in a sort of glacial fluvial deposit and then a confined uh, fractured bedrock aquifer below that. So this is precip stream flow and the different times of record, the different lengths of records here are really um, just dependent on what we have available. And one of the things that you can see is that during this drought in the early 2000s, you can actually see that being reflected in the stream flow in the unconfined aquifer, in the bedrock aquifer, and the response and the, let's say, the timing of the minimum levels in those are essentially lagged compared to the precip signal. So this um, 
difference here is really driven by the connection of water from the land surface down into um, the aquifer signal. So what we're interested in trying to do is trying to understand the relationships between this sort of driving precipitation signal and how stream flow and the different aquifer systems are responding in response to um, climate variability. So this is, um, these are the time series records. These are the normalized anomalies for temperature, precipitation, stream flow, and groundwater across the northeast. Okay, And each one, there's, uh, it's hard to see here, but each red line is an individual site here, and they're all um, overlapping one another. And one of the important things that came out of this GRL paper is that if you look at the magnitude of range here in the groundwater response in, the, in this normalized anomaly, it's much, much greater than sort of this precipitation driving signal in the stream flow, suggesting that this variability has to do with the heterogeneity of the landscape and how these aquifers um, are responding. So um, the next plots I'm going to show you are actually going to be uh, comparing the, um, these individual um, average anomalies uh, between different sites. So that's is what this is. Okay. Again, normalized anomaly here. Uh, a, a positive number is a period that, of time that was wetter. Um, a negative number is drier. This signal here, and each one of these things are sort of a, a dry period, a wet period, a dry period, a wet period that um, we discuss in this paper. But um, the important thing is this is precipitation minus potential ET. So this takes into account of temperature. Um, and here, this is the sort of big 60s drought. This is the 80s drought, 2000s drought. And if this data set went out to the most recent one, it would actually fall somewhere in here. Um, and then if you look at the stream flow record, that's what it looks like. And if you look at the groundwater record, this is what it looks like. And one of the really important things to notice here is that there's a, um, there's a phase shift in the timing of the sort of the minimum precipitation and the minima of the stream flow that then is sort of reflected here even at later time um, in the groundwater records. And one of the important things too is that the groundwater anomalies drop below the stream flow okay, um, during these dry periods, but are essentially coupled on top of one another during the wet periods. And what this reflects is it reflects the falling and the rising of the water table. As the water table drops, it becomes more disconnected with the land surface, and you're not driving as much flow. And that's what this uh, response is down here. During the wet periods, essentially, we're really coupled to the land surface, and we're able to or drive a lot of water from the subsurface um, into the surface reservoirs. We also see this increasing trend of water levels um, over time. If we look at a plot of the anomaly versus the stream flow, this just sort of uh, further illustrates. So this is like a cross plot of those the groundwater and precipitation anomaly. What you see is it kind of turns over here. So the water table can continue, continue to drop, but the stream flow anomaly really starts to reach a minimum in response to that. And this is what the sort of groundwater versus the precipitation looks like. It doesn't have a, the same trend. So um, now I want to show you some uh, water level responses that are not aggregated like I just showed you, but are um, divided up into the different aquifer types. So there's a couple. The Connecticut, and we could talk to Gary about this. Um, is not as, uh, whatever, for whatever the finance, finances are, is not as uh, organized as Massachusetts and Rhode Island and the Climate Response Network. So we don't have a ton of data. This is about all I could grab. Um, but those are distributed mostly in some of these bedrock wells. Um, tills are in Teal, Outwash Plains here, Plymouth Carver System, Cape Cod and the islands, and then the alluvial valley fill. So what we're going to look at is the water level response in those different types of units um, as a function of time. So if, if you just looked at the average water level uh, throughout the hydrologic year, October to September here, these are just like how, um, how high and low does the water level get sort of compared to average for these different types of um, aquifer materials. You could see the, till, the tills and teal and the bedrock, they have more dynamic range in response to the seasonal change. And initially, when I first looked at this, I thought this was all driven by the fact that these 
tills and bedrock aquifers tend to have lower specific yields, meaning that you know maybe it's just the same amount of water, but they don't have as much effective porosity, so that that amount of water can actually cause the water level to um, rise up and down. If we look at now these as a function of time, bedrock, till, outwash plain, and alluvial aquifers, one of the things you can see is even seasonally, okay, sort of these are uh, again, the drought here in the 60s, um, this one in the 2000s, you can see that the range for till and bedrock are much greater than that of sort of the alluvial aquifer systems and what's happening out on Cape Cod and, and the islands. And actually out on Cape Cod and the islands, there's um, a more of a dampen, dampening of the higher frequency signals, um, I think, due to the um, higher hydraulic conductivity of those materials. Um, what we also see is a fairly large number of these wells so showing fairly significant, statistically significant rising water tables associated with this wetter period, um, really going back, um, starting really uh, coming out of the 60s drought going into, um, into the future. Uh, and then there's a strong anthropogenic effect as well um, and some areas showing a declining water level associated with changes in land use and uh, groundwater withdrawal. Um, and we actually, despite seeing that trend, there's not a lot of sites that show a statistically significant precip trend. If you look at uh, stream flow trends, so these are from 1970 to 2010, again, there's some trends that show positive stream flow. But predominantly, if you look at the groundwater trends, we have many more um, sites that actually show this longer term um, increasing water table across the site. Um, and it's actually consistent with some work from the USGS that looked at um, seven day low flow base, base flows across the region, um, suggesting an increase in, um, in the water table and increase in the surface uh, groundwater coupling system. So this is a really crazy plot. I apologize. Um, this is groundwater volume as a function of time for um, the till, the alluvial valley fill, and the outwash plain systems. One of the things you can see by just looking at this up and down, up and down yearly signal from the tills is that there's actually a lot of water that comes in and out of the till. Now this is accounted now for the specific yield. So this is groundwater volume. Um, the, the amount of water in the Quabbin Reservoir, for example, is about four cubic kilometers of water. So we're actually putting water into storage, taking it out on a year, yearly basis. And one of the really important um, sort of assessments that we found is that the tills, um, because of where they are in the uplands, because of their sort of predominant landscape um, covering, uh, they're actually a really important storage and release of water on an annual basis. If we remove the annual signal, so this is, these are interannual changes now, okay? You can see, let's say during the 60s drought, 80s and 2000s, you can actually see that the tills on average lost the most water sort of above and beyond what they would annually see. So this is like a measure of how much water we lost in the tills compared to average over time. And the alluvial valley fills lag that, and then even the outwash plains lag that even more. But because we're in an area that's very well connected to the land surface, the water it's fairly wet, we recover that water actually fairly quickly. So we go above zero. So this is like excess water. This is some water deficit. So the tills play a really important role in uh, groundwater storage and release, which is essential for sort of headwater stream systems for the uh, ecologic communities that rely on those. These are also times of year where we have these large uh, tropical storm systems, okay? Um, so now I'm gonna shift focus and go and look for these signals of um, these uh, sort of extreme precipitation events. And um, sort of fortunately or unfortunately and fortunately, um, Hurricane Irene um, in sort of late August of 2011 um, came really on the heels of a very, very wet August in this region. Um, so we had a, a kind of a coupling of high antecedent moisture conditions associated with, you know, decent precipitation uh, amounts during the event up to, 
you know, five, six inches. I was actually in a five inch rainstorm in, in Texas last week. <laughs> so it's not that anomalous for down there. For up here, it could, uh, really contributed to significant amounts of flooding um, that are in sort of well excess of 100 year events. Interestingly enough, the precipitation amounts were not that all um, remarkable for the time. So one of, the th one of the things we've been trying to understand are these types of events really important for groundwater recharge. Um, in the past, I, I tend to sort of say that, okay, growing season events aren't as important because a lot of that water gets trapped in the soil. Um, but I'm becoming convinced more and more that some of these larger events are actually pretty important for groundwater um, storage. So um, I'm going to show you some data from uh, stable, iso uh, stable isotopes of the water molecule, the hydrogen and oxygen. And I just wanted to comment that um, I was talking with Clay a little bit earlier about this, that um, sort of the isotopic composition of precipitation is not only impacted by sort of uh, kinetic fractionation mechanisms, things that are happening as the water moves into the atmosphere and sort of the rain out effect, but there's also a strong um, control on the, the isotopic composition of uh, the vapor source itself. Um, and this is pretty important for um, this story that I'm about to tell here. So um, there's a really interesting paper that just came out a couple of years ago um, in scientific reports that looked at uh, long-term changes in the isotopic composition of precipitation up here at Hubbard Brook. And they've actually shown that due to more Arctic moisture coming south, that the isotopic composition of precipitation in, of precipitation is actually becoming more depleted with time. Okay, and these are not small changes. Um, so the d-axis is actually increasing, which is the distance off the meteoric water line. If we're decreasing, despite trends where we're increasing temperature, or air temperature, we're actually seeing decreases in the isotopic composition, which is the opposite of what you would expect for um, the temperature effect. Um, so I'm going to show you data from this network here. Um, these are um, it's really two combination of two networks that we've been running. So going out every month or every quarterly and sampling stream waters, sampling groundwaters, um, sampling groundwaters and stream water. So this is this these red dots are paired where we actually have a groundwater isotope sample and a stream water sample co-located. And then this other network here, these squares, are our surface water um, networks. And these catchments range, they're fairly small to fairly large. So this would be like the Deerfield. Um, I'm not, I don't, I don't include the Connecticut River here because the Connecticut River is just uh, a little bit too large to look at some of these more local effects. Um, we have paired groundwater uh, samples uh, and surface water from 24 sites, um, so and so shallow water table depths, and then um, some other surface water sampled uh, monthly. So um, during the time of our isotope network operation that we've been running, um, this is what the hydroclimate um, has done. So uh, precip here, snow. This is a normalized runoff, and this is the groundwater anomaly averaged over the region. Each of these shadings are during um, sort of the uh, winter months here when we've had snow on the ground. Um, this, these two months here, Sept um, August and September of 2011, the wettest two consecutive months in the whole um, instrumental record in Amherst for Western Mass. Okay, Very, very wet. And what you can see actually is that if you look at, so these are the um, spring runoff events here. This is when uh, Hurricane Irene hit. This is the um, peak and the recession from that time period. Very anomalous. So actually last, the recession of Irene and that wet August and September actually lasted almost, um, almost a year. So um, let's take a look at some of the surface water isotopic data here. Um, and so what I'm looking at is the hydrogen isotope of the water molecule, sort of the ratio of the heavy to the light one, the heavy to the light oxygen of the water molecule. This is sort of the global water, um, meteoric water line, so all precipitation would fall on this. Here's what our data looks like. There's um, some depletion during the winter, some um, enrichment during the summer. Um, there's a significant amount of surface water evaporation that tends to pull water off those um, meteoric water lines. 
And here's a plot of um, all the data from our sites. This is oxygen, okay, of the water molecule versus uh, the time of year, okay, going back to 2011 um, up until uh, 2017. And when I first started this, um, this project, um, I was a little bit concerned because I saw this sort of trend, you know, of decreasing um, isotopic composition of the oxygen isotope of our waters over time, thinking it was some, maybe some instrumental thing or something going on. But then I was quickly, I was happy where we started actually seeing some, you know, seasonal signals. So this is like winter runoff, you know, uh, summer, winter, summer. Uh, relationship. These are just again shaded so you can see where we had snow melt on the ground. Um, and there's a fairly significant sort of trend towards um, depletion in this record, which is sort of w at the time was very curious to see what was going on in response to that. Um, it turns out that tr uh, summer pre isotopic composition of precipitation is quite enriched. And um, our composite precipitation sample of Irene actually was quite enriched. It was about almost minus, uh, minus five um, in oxygen. So could that trend that we're seeing in our isotopic composition of stream water be being impacted by um, this large precipitation event that happened around this time? Um, these are samples from um, a project that I had going on in the Deerfield River. And it's a little bit of a funny story. It was from a master student that um, was in the process of finishing up his thesis, collected these samples, but we never analyzed them. They were like sitting on my shelf in my office. And I said, oh, you know, I was looking at this data. I was like, I have some samples sort of from before that event um, in a same area. And actually they plot way down here. Irene plots way up here. So um, what we're trying to understand is the relationship between sort of this uh, precipitation event um, and the isotopic composition of these waters. And it turns out if you look at the small catchments, 40 to 60 kilometers, so just aggregating those, um, and then the larger catchments, and even the larger catchments, what you see is that there seems to be a scaling of the um, sort of recession time or the slope of these trends and the time it takes for, um, let's say, that signal to be uh, removed from the system as a function of catchment size, which would make sense just based on sort of simple uh, storage calculations. So this recession that could be from Irene seems to scale with um, isotopic composition. So now the question is, if what I was telling you earlier about sort of groundwater being really important for stream flow processes is true, then we must, is there a signal of this sort of trend um, or this um, sort of enriched isotopic composition of the waters in the groundwater system. So um, here's all our groundwater data. One of the things that you can see is that there's actually more de excess. It's further off this line. We don't see a lot of that evaporative um, sort of component that we saw in the um, stream flow data. Um, and this is the groundwater anomaly associated with Irene. So these, all these wells that we sample, they their water table rose significantly in response to Irene. So if this water is Irene water and this is this enriched water from um, both Irene and another tropical storm after that, we should be seeing that signal in their isotopic composition. So, and then this is sort of our drying trend towards that uh, sort of drought that we had um, this last year. So here's what we see in our groundwater isotopic composition. So this is oxygen hydrogen, de excess, and this is the water level. And so we didn't, I didn't quite figure this out until like late 2013 that this might be happening when we started collecting these samples. So I don't have stuff that goes back, you know, to sort of before or, or immediately after the event. But we see these really interesting sort of downward trends in oxygen and hydrogen and actually an increase in de excess, okay? And, um, a, a majority of the wells, 14 out of 21, have statistically significant trends in oxygen and hydrogen isotopes. And these things aren't small either. They're, they're actually quite large. Um, if you look at the st statistics, I don't have time to go through here, but essentially what we're seeing is a decrease in the oxygen and hydrogen isotopes. Um, and they're much greater than that 
uh, trend that I showed you up at, um, at Hubbard Brook that they saw in the precipitation isotopes. So let's just take a quick look at what these things look at like in hydrogen oxygen space. Here's Irene and the arrows point to the evolution of those waters over time. So each color here is one of the different wells that we study. Okay, so you can see all of these guys are sort of trending sort of away from um, this more enriched signal. Now, part of this is a coincidence because most of the water in this region sort of falls along this trend, but nevertheless, they're showing this sort of evolution from more enriched um, to more depleted. And one of the really interesting things is that the magnitude of the, of the slope of the trend in oxygen uh, is actually well correlated here to how much the water table fluctuates in the season. So this is essentially, these are, these are wells in till, where the water table goes up and down, up and down a lot. We actually have the most change. So essentially we're uh, pushing that um, enriched water more towards whatever sort of this longer term uh, equilibrium uh, isotopic composition should be. So that the wells retrieved the most recharge are actually uh, changing the fast. So I'm going to um, sort of sum up with this um, sort of diagram here, just t giving you a conceptualization with what I think is happening in response. Again, um, Hurricane Irene uh, in August and September over here. Here's what the larger streams were doing on average. Here's the stream flow discharge and snow melt. We've got to think about snow melt here because it could be a signal that could be sort of pulling down and depleting our waters. Okay, that's what uh, Irene precip looks like. Um, this is the base flow. This, so this is the physical recession time. Okay, so this is, this is like the hydraulic wave propagating through the system. Um, it's, it's always amazing when I look at this how long. Um, you, you, this is the snow melt, you know, here and you can actually see Irene still that response there. And these are what the groundwater isotopes do on top of this um, sort of average. What's cool is that actually in the summer sort of you can see the summer stream flow sort of coming up to the groundwater and then they're uh, mixed with some um, snow melt here and then they come back and they're mixed with some snow melt. Um, and, but they always seem to kind of come up towards this trend line. So I think if I had the data that went back in time these things would probably be going like this, maybe, maybe not. So this is consistent with this sort of large scale. Remember I showed you this hill slope model where we're kind of filling up the hill slope and then draining over time. Um, I think this isotope data is telling us a similar story of sort of the sort of pre-large event. We've got a water table that looks like that. After this large event, um, a rapid influx of this enriched water um, causing a sort of significant um, sort of depletion of the uh, water over time. So um, I was talking with Clay about this earlier, sort of some back of the envelope response times, resonance times of the isotopic composition in the system on the order of five to six years for the larger systems. Um, and actually for the smaller catchments, um, you know, fairly quick sort of moving that water through. So. Um, I'm going to wrap up here and just uh, conclude with just a couple key points. You know, we're, we're seeing fairly large changes in our climate and the hydrologic response. Um, sort of one thing that I've been harping on and, and trying to convince um, sort of state regulators is that we need to really consider groundwater is not just all about water supply. It's how water makes it from the hill slope to the stream. Uh, the hydraulic properties um, of these glacial sediments their impacts have a strong response. And actually, I think some of these extreme precipitation events can have, are more important than we realize in terms of sort of larger scale water resources issues here in the Northeast and that they're significant for groundwater storage. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions that you have. Yeah, Gary. Yeah, yeah. Well, if um, I don't, I don't know if I have the data here. Um, let me just quickly see. Um, the fractured bedrock. If you look at the isotopic composition of the fractured bedrock. Oh yeah. Um, I just, so the black dots 
are the fractured bedrock isotopic composition. They're here. These are the tills. These are the uh, sort of alluvial valley fills. They actually have distinct isotopic composition. And I think what, what we're seeing sort of combining the hydrology or the hydraulic data that we have and the isotopic composition is that the bedrock aquifers are sort of like seasonally recharged. They're seasonally connected to the land surface on average where they receive, it's like a valve that opens when you have the right soil moisture conditions where you can actually, you know, cause or at least drive water into the subsurface. And we actually, I don't know if you saw in some of the wells that you guys monitor or work with a response from, from Irene, but there are a number of bedrock wells that we monitor where in, in the six or seven years of collecting data, it was the largest hydraulic response that we've ever seen from a precipitation event in, uh, you know, in the growing season. Um, so I think it has implications for how bedrock aquifer systems recharge and how they're connected to the, to the land surface for sure. Um, but that's still something that we're trying to, tr trying to piece out. So if, uh, just an open call, if any of you guys uh, um, have a bedrock well for, for your water supply for your home or work on it, send me samples. I'm happy to analyze isotopes and share you guys the results. <laughs> yeah, anyway, for free. Is, 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 I'll, I'll, um, I will send Tim. I'll, I'll, I'll send him a, an address and I'll actually send you the bottles that you need and everything. Or if you want... The nice thing about isoto you know, water isotopes, it's pretty, like, I I'm a physical hydrologist and I can kind of do this stuff. And so, you know, they're, pr they're pretty, uh, uh, you know, now that we have these laser specs and it's not a mass spec and this intimidating thing, they're pretty, pretty straightforward. But most of the data that, like this bigger isotope project that we're working on, it, it's all just volunteer networks. We just had a group that went out and we sampled 300 um, streams and ponds and lakes across Massachusetts uh, on Saturday just for instantaneous sampling. Um, it's amazing. Like you can see, these are really, these are just groundwater. I mean, it, it, across a small state like Massachusetts, and I would expect the same for Connecticut, you know, there's like, you know, five per mil variability. And it's, it's quite a bit. And it's, it's, not, it's not all driven by the precip signal. It's driven by when water becomes recharged, how well connected the aquifer system is to surf nearby surface water. And that's what we're trying to piece out with these data. So it's complicated though. It's, there's a lot of variability. So trying to, trying to throw with statistics at our back, you know, trying to understand what's happening. Yeah. How do you tell the difference between old versus new water? Hmm. So, there's a lot of different ways or approaches to do that. Um, and this example that I showed you from that Sleepers River study, what, what, what these guys did in this particular case is they looked at the isotopic composition of, uh, let's, let's, let's keep it simple, let's keep it due to a precipitation event. So they actually measure the isotopic composition of the precipitation coming into the system you know, with a rain gauge during an event, and they'll mix, mix that with the isotopic composition of the stream water that they sample. So you actually sample like stream water with an auto sampler during, you know, during this event. And then you'll compare that with an end member groundwater isotopic composition. And you'll do a linear mixing between those two. So you could say, okay, new water is like the water that fell out of the sky. Old water is the water that's it's in the ground. So that, w that would be an example with, with the isotopes that I showed you. Um, people have done it with chloride. There are um, a number of other tracers people have used um, in really large systems. Um, we've done some work in the, in the Atacama Desert. We're dealing with um, other isotopic systems. Could be tritium, it could be carbon-14, for example, so. Yeah. So why are the old and new water isotopes different? Because the new water that's coming in is not is not generating the it's it's generating the stream flow by a hydraulic push, right? It's kind of coming into the ground, sort of like what you see here. But it's not it's not able to make it all the way to to the stream, right? So it's 
essentially raising the water table through hydraulic, there's a pressure wave that propagates through. So those new isotopes come in up here and then they, they mix with the other waters, okay, and then move slowly why, to the stream. Why are they why well, are they oh, so could just be, sorry, could be just seasonally. Okay. So like for, for ex just for the, sorry, sorry, Tim, for the, for the same reason, like Irene um, or some summer, summer precipitation because the temperature or the source of vapor is different than win winter precipitation, th that's a different signal. So you're actually, you're using a natural tracer in that way. Yeah. And it's, so you're, you're kind of at the mercy of what, what the sky gives you, to, so to speak. So, yeah, Mike. Yeah, yeah, and um, well, like for example, the, um, the the paper, that scientific reports paper, that's that's how. Well, one of their arguments for why you're seeing this trend towards um, depletion is that they actually see more vapor coming out of Hutt, the Hudson Bay region with high split. The ice coverage up there. Yeah, yeah, and so. Um, what was the, we had, we really had a pretty boring um, sort of tropical storm system last year up here, but there was like Nate or something that came up or one of those ones. You could actually, if you look, we have a we have about 14 stations now that were running for precip isotopes across the state. Um, and you can actually see that signal quite clearly and then relate it back to sort of the golf, you know, this sort of, it was golf related moisture. But, um, New England is, is, is a challenge because we get a lot of water from different areas. So um, that's, it's a bit of a challenge. And maybe that's one of the reasons why we see so much variability here. Um, there's been some, Carol Kendall and Tyler Copland have done some work across the United States looking at oxygen and hydrogen isotopes in river waters. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And after, if you look at their gradient, or the difference is th this region is is fairly large. I mean, out really outside of like the Cascades going into the, you know, into the sort of high rocky desert area on the other side of the rain shadow there. This this region has a pretty large pre uh, variability in, in isotopes. So, yeah, well. Oh, I don't think so. I think it's, um, if you like, again, if you look back to our sort of precipitation, um, you know, these are some of these times where we had more precipitate, or you know, more, more tropical precipitation. Um, but I don't think Irene in itself, um, what, what, what was unique and what Brian Yellen, who st studied the geomorphology and the geomorphologic, response, what he would argue is that Irene coming on the heels of a fairly wet year was, was, was significant. So if we have, you know, if you look at the climate projections and, you know, if, if we're, you know, going to be continued, like, let's say up on this trend rather than this trend over here, or at least flat, when we get these larger storm events, they might actually have more impact than they would if they were, but it was followed by a, by, by a drier period. Yeah. So then yeah. That, that signal you're seeing, yeah. long drawdown could be that combination. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. That's true. Yeah, and it also was followed by um, one of the snowiest. Um, I, was in, I was in sabbatical in Chile, but I've heard that we got a lot of snow. <laughs> I have pictures of somebody shoveling off my, the roof of my house. Uh, and so trying to tease out those, those different climate signals. But yeah, that's, you know, coming on, you know, this 2011 and then this dry period, um, I think might play a role in maybe how quickly that, that signal is being sort of flushed out of the system. Um, so. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I, m me, myself, I haven't, but um, I know, so there's at Harvard Forest, they now, um, 
have you guys heard of NEON, so the National Ecological Observatory Network? There's some stations where they're collecting that data, which would be a nice complement. But I think that would be that would be really interesting, for sure. Um, you know, I'm, you know, it's it's one of the things I think we're learning as a community, especially like on the environmental side, is like there's no substitute for some of these long-term studies that we have and like you go and you look at that 40 or 50 years of precipitation isotopes I mean you know trying to trying to take that and then and then you know adding adding some of the some you know vapor isotopes and trying to make sense of that would I think it would be a really good idea um, but you know it's hard to separate out the year-to-year -year variability or that's what I would be concerned about but you got to start somewhere and let's hope we as a US scientific community continue to invest in those types of things. So well with that, I think we can break for lunch. All right. Thanks a lot.